weapon attack. You win this for the moon. I'm winning. Good work, Voltar. Demon attack really is tough. A magic demon attack. Oh. Welcome to 8-Bit, a channel to discover how you can make games for the 8-Bit Atari video computer system from 1978. In this episode, we'll explore how to do animation that can be applied to your player and missile graphics. So let's get started and kick off Season 2. While it's possible to create a game that features no graphic animation at all, as we can plainly see here with the game Pong, and again in the game Miniature Golf. In both games, the only movement on the screen are the objects themselves, but in this, Pong's execution still works because it involves risk and skill. Miniature Golf, though, really is quite boring. Incorporating even just a couple frames of animation can add a lot of personality and charm to the game. As we can see here in the game Bump and Jump, the animation on the car's tires adds a ton of movement to the screen, making it more lively and exciting. However, I think my favorite animation comes from the game Demon Attack. The flapping along with the colors and the movement keep the screen exciting, even when you're down to just one demon left. Animation on the Atari 2600 is basically no different than on TV and movies. It's simply a series of two or more pictures that are slightly different and showing them in sequence one after the other. It could be a spaceship exploding, a man running, or a fire burning. Let's start simple with a screen and a single non-animated ghost. First, we'll open up the sprite editor in the Atari Dev Studio. You can learn more about that in our previous episode called Code Faster with the Atari Dev Studio. I'll include a link in the description. We'll create two frames for the ghost and export the code to use in our program. These two frames will be used in all of the examples. In example one, we'll use the same code we used in the previous episode called More Sprites in Color. Again, I'll include the link in the description. The important part of this code is how we're loading which line of the graphic to display on our scan line. You can see here, we're loading a value located at the index given in the Y register, starting at the memory address represented by ghost F0. Ghost F0 is actually a static hard-coded value that the assembler will replace with the real memory address of the graphic when it's building the binary ROM file. If we look at the actual opcode the assembler generates, we can see that our load instruction is the hex value B9, while the address the ghost graphic is located at is 72F0, as represented in little Indian form, where the least significant bit is stored before the most significant bit. A more human readable form of this address would be F072, which is what you'll see in a debugger. We'll have a video on debugging coming up, so make sure you subscribe and click the notification bell so you'll always know when a new video is up. What we need to swap the two frames of our graphic is a way to change the memory address that's used when loading our graphic. To accomplish this, we'll use something called a pointer. Pointers can be a little difficult to understand when you first encounter them in programming, but the concept is simple. Typically, you would store a value in a byte of RAM like the number of players in a game, or how many missiles you have left. A pointer doesn't hold a value, it holds a memory address pointing to where the value is. When you use a pointer, you won't get the number of players or remaining missiles, you'll get the address where you can find these values. First, we'll need to reserve two bytes for our pointer. This will ensure that the assembler will not use those two bytes for anything else. In this particular case, our pointer will use the two bytes located at the addresses 84 and 85. Then we'll use the assembler to get the least significant byte of the 16-bit address where the ghost graphic resides and store it in the first byte we defined for our pointer. Then pull the most significant byte of the address and store it into the second byte of the pointer. In RAM, this would look like this with the address 84 containing the least significant byte value of 72, and address 85 containing the most significant byte value, F0. 
Then, in our load instruction, we use brackets around our pointer, which tells the assembler that we want to use the indirect load value opcode to get the value located at the memory address found in the two bytes located at the pointer address. The indirect load value instruction is assembled with the opcode of B1, and the address of the pointer is at the address 84. The B1 opcode will use the values stored in the memory addresses 84 and 85 as the 16-bit RAM address. Now we're no longer using the static address of the ghost graphic in our load routine, and when we execute our code, our ghost is still with us. We have our code using our pointer address to draw our graphic. Let's use that to swap which ghost frame we're going to draw. We could swap our graphics for every screen frame, but that would swap them so fast that you wouldn't be able to see the animation. It would just look like the ghost is flickering, which can be used for other game mechanics like in Miss Pac-Man when the ghosts are returning to their non-edible form. For our purposes, we're going to swap the ghost frame every eight screen frames. We'll start by creating a variable to hold which screen frame we're currently showing. Next, we'll add a bit of logic to flip which frame of animation we'll use every eighth screen frame. The algorithm we'll use will count up to 16 and return zero for the first eight screen frames and one for the rest. Then the screen frame counter will reset back to zero to do it all over again. We start by increasing the current value of the screen frame in memory by one and then load it into the accumulator. Now we'll use the AND instruction to AND the value 15 with the screen frame we just loaded into the accumulator. This will reset the count back to zero if the screen frame is above 15. Otherwise, it will return the value zero through 15. Now that we know our screen frame is within zero through 15, we're going to shift the bit of our accumulator value to the right using the LSR instruction. We'll use a screen counter of seven as an example. In binary, seven would be represented as 00000111. Shifting the bits to the right drops off the very first bit resulting in 00000011, which is equal to three in decimal. To make this more useful for our purposes, we'll need to reduce it down a little more by shifting the bits to the right two more times. This will leave us with a value of zero, which indicates we will use the first frame of the graphic animation. If our screen frame counter was eight, that would give us a binary equivalent of 0001000. And then when shifted right three times, leaves us with a value of one, which indicates that we'll use the second frame of the graphic. So screen frames zero to seven will result in zero, using the first frame of the animation. And eight to 15 will result in a one using the second frame. Now we can use our branch to jump to which graphic frame we want to assign to the pointer. This part works the same as the previous example, except for some duplicated code we used to set up our pointer. We'll take care of that shortly. Running the code, we have a nicely animated ghost. So now our code can flip between animation frames based on the timing we created. And we have our logic to determine which frame we're going to display. However, this implementation is a little messy when we look at that part of the code. The good news is that we can move that part of the code and set it up during assembly. For this, we're going to create a couple of data tables to store the least and most significant bytes for both of our graphic animation frames. Now when we assign the pointer, we can use the load instructions index parameter to pull the graphics frame from the data table. Since our algorithm to calculate which graphic to use results in either a zero or a one, this works nicely for selecting the index from the data table. This change removes the branch and our jump from the previous example, saving us a bit of time and making the code more readable. Running the new code, he's still there hovering just a bit more efficiently. Let's tweak the code a little and give him a friend. Once again, we've covered a lot of information in this episode, and all of the examples are available on our GitHub, which I'll link to in the description. 
you can follow along on social media and our website. There's not a lot at the moment, but once I figure it all out, you can be sure I'll start posting more information, behind the scenes details, and a little history. If you found the video interesting, I'd appreciate it if you hit that like button and share and let others know. And if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to the channel and hit the bell icon to make sure you're notified when a new video comes out. If you'd like to help support the development of the channel, please consider becoming a patron. I'll link to that in the description as well. That's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you later. Faster than a speeding waitress. Faster than a short order cook. Faster even than a drive up window. It's fast food from Telesis, the hot new video game for your Atari VCS. Eat all the fast food you can, burgers, shakes, fries, as fast as you can, but watch out for the purple pickles. That's tummy trouble. Fast food.